Good morning, Willow Creek Community Church. Yeah, it's great to be with you. Welcome those of you watching online. Hey, I need your help uh, with something real quick. So I've been in the role leading the church for a little over a year, and I realized there's a group I haven't thanked yet, and it's our staff. And, you know, Steph just did the announcements for the first time, did a great job. There's so many staff who've taken on new challenges to serve our church. They've done a fantastic job. Would you join me and just thank them for how faithfully and joyfully they've served the church? Yeah, great job. All right, uh, I want to welcome in all the congregations of our church. Welcome to Chicago and North Shore and South Lake. Welcome to Wheaton and Crystal Lake and Huntley. Glad you're here with us and those of you watching online as well. Hey, can we give a big hand? Our Huntley campus a couple weeks ago opened their brand new beautiful building. Love to cheer them on and encourage them. Way to go, Huntley. Now, uh, we're in uh, this series called We Are Here. And if you're newer to the church, uh, here's the basis for this series. Our church is in a unique place. In a few ye- weeks, we're going to celebrate our 44th anniversary as a church. And God's been so good to our church all these 44 years. But we are in a transition season. Uh, we aren't where we were in the past, and we're not yet where we're going to be in the future. Uh, I think soon, in the next uh, couple months or so, you're going to hear an update on a senior pastor search. We'll be talking about where we're going as a future, but we're kind of in this in between place. And in these kinds of seasons, the temptation is to just kind of push through it. Just say, I I, I just want to move forward. I just want to go. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be in between. I want to be there. But see, here's the truth. God does some of his best work in us as individuals and as a church in moments like this one. And so we just said as a church, we are right here. This is where we are. We aren't going to just pretend we're in the future or in the past. We're going to acknowledge this is where we are, and we're going to ask God to shape us into the church he needs us to be as we move towards that future. Make sense? In this, yeah. In this, we've been studying what does it look like for us to serve together and just saying, for the future of our church, we're gonna learn and devote ourselves to serving each other. Uh, We've talked about what it means to pray, and this season has changed how we pray as a church. I think it's made us much more dependent, much more aware of God's presence and needing his presence. Uh, We've talked about what it means to worship. One of the things we've grown in is how we worship as a church. And today we're starting a new portion called Share. What does it look like for us to be sharing this faith as a church with others who aren't here, who aren't a part of God's family? In these moments, in these seasons, uh, one of the things you have to ask is, what was true of the past that isn't going to be true of the future? You're going to say, it was good for a season, but we're leaving it there. And you have to be intentional about that. And there are other things where you say this was beautiful in the past and we're going to grab hold to it and carry it to the future because we can't imagine our future without it. That's one of the things we'll talk about today. 23 years ago is when I was introduced to Willow, came on staff right out of college. And one of the things that amazed me about this church that I wanted to learn from and see and experience was that I knew this church was devoted to their friends who maybe had never walked into a church before. I knew that this church would sacrifice for their friends, knew that they intentionally built buildings bigger than they needed to, and prayed that every seat would be filled by someone who'd never heard the good news of God's love, knew that they took immense risk for their friends, and I knew that time and time again, God answered their prayers, filled the seats, and saw people come to faith in huge numbers. My first year, I remember we baptized a thousand people, and I couldn't comprehend this. And I'm telling you today, the temptation may be to leave that in our past. And I say that is not going to be the case for this church. That we will always be a church, always be a church, who does whatever it takes to reach their friends, who sacrifices for them, who's intentional about them, who loves them, who's thoughtful and sincere. We will always be a church where every person is welcome. That is not going to be something we talk about the good old days. That's going to be something we hope for and pray for, that it's always the case for us, yes? And here's why. Here's why. Because this is the core of Jesus' heart. Jesus himself, you read through the Gospels, get to the end, the very end, and you'll see something happens. Jesus pays the price for sins on that Good Friday on the cross. He takes care of every person's sins for the whole world. It's done, he says. And then he goes to Easter, and he overcomes death in the grave on that Easter Sunday. And after those two miraculous events, he then appears to his disciples, and he gives them a challenge. He first tells them, everything you need for eternity has been done for. I did it all. 
And then he says, now here's the thing. You now carry this message to the world. Tell everyone about this incredible news. Tell them, lead them to faith, disciple them, and baptize them in my name. He gives them a global mission that we, his followers, once you've received grace, it's now our responsibility to steward this message, to share it with as many people as we have in our little sphere of influence. That is his challenge, that you and I would be the bringers of this incredible message to every person we know. Now, I know that you may have known this already, but maybe you need a little reminder. What does it look like for us each, if we're a Christian, if we've received grace, what does it look like for us to be the ones to share this message with others? So what we're going to talk about today, and we're going to recommit ourselves and devote ourselves to this kind of life. And what I want to do is I want to look at one story from Jesus' life, just one, where he demonstrates what does it look like to share an incredible message with someone who does not know this truth. And the story I want to look at, it's really just two key characters. It's Jesus and it's a man named Zacchaeus. Now, I grew up in a church that happened to sing a song about Zacchaeus. We're in church, tell the truth. Raise your hands if you have heard the song about Zacchaeus in your church before as well. Yes, me too. If you haven't, I'm gonna just tell you, I'm not gonna sing it, so we just, just take that. But this song, it basically, if you've heard it, you're gonna fill in the blanks. The song just says Zacchaeus was a wee man. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. How offensive is that? I gotta imagine Zacchaeus is in heaven. He goes, out of everything about me, that's all you care about. The song says Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Wow. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And the Lord said, Zacchaeus. You come down. That's the whole song. That's it. That's the whole song. If you interpret this song, you would think the story of Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus is it's the good news that grace is even available to short people, right? That's what you would think this story's about. Now, here's the thing. When you read through the Bible, one of the things you have to ask yourself is, why, out of all the stories of Jesus' life, why is this included? Why did they take the time to write that one? Why, in an era, that day when Jesus lived, the ability to write a book was incredibly costly. Why would they choose that story? Scribes, for hundreds of years after that, copied this by hand so you and I could hear this story. I don't think they did all that work so that we could know short people get into heaven too. I think there's more to the story. And I think maybe that song kind of inoculated us from the story, and we've missed it. I've never in my life heard a sermon about this man's life, I think because of this song. So I want to unpack this story for you. You may not know more than that, but I think God has something to teach us about what it means for us to share this message with our friends. So let's dive in. This is in Luke 19. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and open it. Luke 19 tells this story. It says this, as Jesus was passing through Jericho... Jericho is a major city. Jesus decides to go right through it. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to know and see Jesus. But because he was short, he couldn't see over the crowd. So Zacchaeus runs ahead, and he climbs a tree to see him. All right, there's the basis of the story. A couple things to note here real quick. Zacchaeus, you see, yes, of course, he's short. But there's a few more details about his life. Zacchaeus was a tax collector and a chief tax collector. Now, this is more than just a guy who works for the IRS. Here's the context. Uh, in that era, Rome had conquered Israel. Uh, Israel was an occupied nation. There were Roman centurions there to enforce the law. And one of the things Rome did was they recruited people from the countries that they conquered, individuals who were part of that country, they recruited them as tax collectors. They paid them a great salary but you need to see these people were viewed as traitors. They had betrayed their own people to collect tax for an occupying force. They were despised, hated. And a couple more things in this. Zacchaeus isn't just a tax collector. He's the chief tax collector. He's at the top of the food chain. So he was immensely wealthy. And then one more piece. The tax collectors were legally able to increase the tax 
and they would take some off the top. I'll give you an example. If Rome was asking for a 25% tax, the tax collector could say, hey, let's just round it up to 30, and I get that extra 5%. You see why they're hated? Their own people viewed them as traitors, thieves. That extra 5% you're stealing from your brother and your sister and your neighbor and your friend. You're a thief. Zacchaeus, you have to ask yourself, why in the world would you do this? And I've got to believe he was motivated by greed. That when he had the opportunity to become this and saw the wealth he would have, he said, why would I turn this down? And he chose it, unaware of all that would cost him. See, these tax collectors were hated. They had lost their friends and their home and so much more than that. See, the religion of that day viewed tax collectors as thieves because that percentage you took off the top, that doesn't belong to you. So they're now viewed as sinful by their actions and the religion of Jesus' day rejected them. They could not go into the temple. They could not worship in the synagogue. And even beyond that, the Jewish faith believed that even sharing a meal was an extension of your religion, so you could not even eat with a tax collector. This man was truly lost. He had all the money in the world, but nothing that really mattered. No friends, no family, no connection to his community. He lived amongst a people that he was rejected from and despised. He's hated. Now, two more things you see. Zacchaeus is desperate. There's two verbs used to describe his actions. One is that he's running. He's running. Now in that day, Jesus' day, the only people who ran were children and servants. Men, adult men, no, we don't run. This is below us. We have to have standards and we walk as men, right? It's respectful, it's dignified. Why would any of us run? And yet here Zacchaeus is seen running. I believe again, it's out of desperation for Jesus. He's running to see him. And then it shows that he makes the decision to climb a tree. Show of hands, how many of you climbed a tree in the last few years? Nobody, yeah, me, well, too. Uh, as an adult person, I have not climbed a tree, right? It's been since childhood. It's just kids climb trees, unless you're a professional tree climber. Zacchaeus, desperate. Again, my reading through the New Testament, he's the only example of someone climbing a tree. This is where he is. He's gained all the money he could ever want, lost all the things that matter, and then he hears about this person, Jesus, and he's heard enough that he knows he's got to see this person. He's got to get a glimpse of him. He's got to see what he's about. It's not just enough to be around him. He actually wants to see him face to face, so he climbs the tree just so he can see over the crowd that's the setting. That gets you into his heart and his life and his desperation. Story continues. Says that when Jesus marches through Jericho and reaches that spot, he looks up and says, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I've got to stay at your house today. And so Zacchaeus came down once and welcomed him gladly. All right. There's a lot of nuances in what just happened that you need to capture. First off, one of the signs to the Jewish people that someone was a uniquely religious person or a prophet was when they would meet someone for the first time and know their name. That was a sign to them. This person's got a special place in this faith. Something supernatural is going on with this person. He knows people's names before he's, got, before he's met them. That's what Jesus does. He walks into the crowd, looks at Zacchaeus, and he knows his name. Zacchaeus, come on down. So immediately the crowd would go, Jesus might be who we think he could be, a prophet, right? But then he does something that amazes them all. Jesus invites himself to Zacchaeus' house. A little bit offensive, right? Like, I don't know about you, but I don't enjoy it if someone invites themselves to my house. I want to invite them, right? But Jesus, here's what's happening. Again, no one was allowed to go to Zacchaeus' house. No one. And here, this person of unique religious status, who's a teacher and a prophet, he is saying, I'm going to go to your home. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to dine with you. Remarkable, isn't it? Jesus intentionally, out of this huge crowd, sees the one person he wants to be with, and it's the one person that everyone hates and despises. And he's going to be with him. Now, how do you think 
all the people responded to this. Do you think they're excited about this? They think this is great news. The Bible actually continues, says, all the people saw this and they began to mutter. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and he shouted, look, Lord, he's talking to Jesus, look, Lord, here I now give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody, if I've taken any off the top, if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I'm going to pay them back four times the amount. And Jesus declares, today salvation has come to this man's house. Because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Isn't that beautiful? Zacchaeus has one of the more dramatic conversion stories in the New Testament. Zacchaeus, a very wealthy person, the minute that Jesus is threatened, the minute that Jesus is spoken badly of, the minute that the crowd begins to turn on Jesus, he declares the transformation and says, I'm given half of everything. I'm given half of my wealth to the poor. Use it. And then he goes, if I've cheated any of you, line up on the front door. Just line up. I'll give you four times whatever I took from you. I'm going to make right what has been done wrong. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get right with us. My hunch is Zacchaeus may have given away his entire wealth that day. All right? Quite a transformation. Jesus then declares a couple things. First off, he declares his mission. He goes, if you want to know why I'm here, if you want to know why I left heaven to come to this earth, here it is. I came here to seek and save those who are lost. He said, the ones that you reject, I'm on the lookout for them. The ones that you despise, I'm going to do everything I can to restore them. The ones who are left alone, that's exactly what I'm looking for. I'm here to save the ones who are lost. I'm here to restore them. I'm here for them. Now, some of you, some of you, if you're honest, you feel a little lost in your life right now. Could be that your life just right now is lacking meaning. You go, I do the same thing day after day, and I go, is this all there is? And you just have that sense of being lost. This is good news for you. Jesus came for you. Some of you, in a moment of pain, turned to a substance in the hope that it would ease that pain. And that substance then became an addiction. And now it has hold of you and you feel completely lost. This is good news for you. Jesus came for you. But some of you made a decision and you broke your wedding vows. And your marriage is on the rocks. And you regret the decisions you made and what you've lost. And you wonder, is there any hope for me? And there's good news that Jesus is here for you. In each of these instances, Jesus is saying, I came for the broken ones and the hurting ones. I'm here for you. I'm not here to judge. I'm here to save. That's the core message of this book. He goes to the most sinful person in the crowd and said, I'm going to share a meal with you. I'm coming to your house today. Because I came to seek and save that which was lost. Beautiful story, right? It's one aspect of this. The other is this. Notice at the very end, Jesus didn't just save and establish Zacchaeus' eternity in heaven. He did that. But there was one other aspect of his restoration and his salvation, and it was he restored him to his community. It's found at the very end. He says, this man too is a son of Abraham. And what he's saying is, he has been rejected all these years because of a decision to become a tax collector. You rejected him from this community, and now with this decision to pay back all that he's done, I'm restoring him. He's one of us, is what Jesus is saying. It's one of the beautiful things Jesus does. Is he expands the family. He says, we can leave your past in the past, and you can get a new start, a new day, a fresh beginning. It's part of this faith. You can find that kind of hope. And that's what he offers to Zacchaeus, transforms his life. When I came to faith, I had two fears that I never told any about, about faith. Fear number one is that Jesus would ask me to do something really embarrassing. Fear number two is that God would ask I give away all my money. Zacchaeus faced both of these on the same day, didn't he? It was part of his transformation. He did an incredibly embarrassing act that everyone saw. That's why it's in the Bible. He ran. He climbs a tree. And then out of love for his Savior and out of a desire to be reconciled, he gave away all the money and all the wealth that never really mattered anyway. Gave it all away out of love for this man, Jesus, out of his Savior. Isn't that beautiful? Zacchaeus, by the way, just, just fun fact for nerds like me. Zacchaeus is never mentioned again in the Bible. 
But history tells us he shows up a little bit later and he's the bishop of one of the first churches in Caesarea. See, this isn't just a story about a short man who came to faith. This was the salvation story of one of the church leaders years later. How did this bishop come to be such greatness? And you go, oh, he started as a tax collector, saved from all that. As a despised person, Jesus saw him, went to his house, had a meal with him, transformed his life. Isn't that beautiful? It's a testimony to the early church of what God could do. Now in this, this is the story, but what do you take out of that to learn on how to share this faith? Three things I want to share with you. Three things Jesus does that I think translate to our culture today and how we are to live and to share. First one is you see that Jesus moves toward people. It's so basic. Very beginning, it says that he went through Jericho. Now what you need to know is Jericho wasn't his destination. He was going beyond Jericho. And if he wanted to go quickly, he could have just gone around the city. He could have just said, hey, that's going to slow us down. Let's just go around. He could have said, oh, I don't want to be inconvenienced by the crowd. Let's go around. But he intentionally said, I'm going through the city. I'm going to go straight into the crowd. Why? Because he's moving toward people. Let me ask you, are you moving towards people that you don't know? Are you moving towards people who may not know the message of Jesus? Are you moving towards individuals who could use a little love and grace in their life? Or have you chosen a life that frees you up from inconvenience? I thought about this as an analogy. When I'm driving in my car, I pull up a driving app to give me directions, and I love that it constantly routes me away from traffic. Don't you love that? Because I don't want to be inconvenienced by traffic. I want to get to my destination as fast as I can, accomplish what I need to do. I'm a busy man. Many of us can live our lives this way, where we intentionally navigate around people so that we can accomplish what we want to accomplish, and we miss out. Jesus here demonstrates your life, once you become a Christian, it is not your own. You aren't to be living a life of convenience. You're to move towards the people who most need this message. So let me ask, is there anybody in your life that you go, this is a close friend who does not yet know who God is? Or have you oriented your life around just a few, maybe they're all Christians? Uh, something I experienced early on was being a part of a church I became friends with the people in the church, and before I knew it, all my friends were Christians. I had no one to share this with. So I knew, and this started in high school, I had to intentionally change the patterns of my life to be around people who didn't go to church. I had to say no to great things at church so that I could say yes to other things to build these kinds of friendships, moving toward people. I picked up a lot of different sports. I got involved in clubs. I did theater in college. I did all sorts of things intentionally just so I could be around people who didn't sit in a church. Does this make sense? Yeah. If you want to live this out, you have to find patterns in your life to move towards people, to connect with them, to relate to them. You have to choose to be inconvenienced to be around them so that you have a relationship. You've got to move towards people. How are you doing on that? Jesus did it. He moved towards the crowd. He allowed them to inconvenience him so that he could see the one. And that's the next part. Jesus overcame all the distractions to see that one person who needed him. You get the sense he's scanning every crowd looking. Is there anybody here desperate for me? Here he is. He's in a tree, right? He looks past everyone else and sees that one person who needs. How are you doing at this? Are you open and aware and sensing who God might have you play a role with? If you've got the friends who aren't Christians, are you involved in their life enough to know their pain and their story? Are you thoughtful and prayerful about how you can serve them and care for them? Have you moved beyond just surface to a little more depth so you know their story and their history so that you can get past all the distractions and really know them? How are you doing on this one? Not just that you've got these kinds of friends, but that you're engaged with them and intentional and aware. Jesus moved to the crowd. Then he overcame distractions to see the one. And then finally, he demonstrates respect in the invitation. He demonstrates respect in the invitation. You saw this, that Jesus intentionally goes to Zacchaeus and says, I'm coming to your house for lunch today, you and me. Now, there's something you need to notice. 
I've already mentioned that no one ate with Zacchaeus, so this was a beautiful thing that Jesus re-entered a meal with him. That was key. But the other thing is, we don't know anything that happened at that meal. Do you know why? Because nobody was invited. Jesus showed up at Jericho with all his disciples, but when he went to lunch with Zacchaeus, he said to them, You're, you can't come in. It's me and Z just the two of us. It's a one-on-one -on -one lunch. Immense respect, isn't it? He's basically saying to Zacchaeus, this isn't about a show. I'm not doing this so others can see what I'm going to say to you. This is just you and me. It's respectful. See, Jesus cares so much about Zacchaeus. He's like, you're not a sermon illustration. You're not going to be a demonstration of how I do this. It's just, I care about you that much. I just want to have a conversation. Are you thoughtful and kind and respectful as you think about your invitations to your friends? Are you, are you wise, understanding there's a lot of different things you can invite them into? Are you courageous in making the invite? And most often, I see an invite as a critical step in anyone's journey of faith. How are you doing at these three? If you think about these three, which is the one you need to grow in? Do you need to move towards people? Do you need to overcome distractions to really know them? Not just be acquaintances, but deeper than that. Do you need to demonstrate respect and maybe make a few more invitations? Which one would you say, that's my one, that's what I gotta do to be better at sharing this faith? Which one would you choose? My life, time and time again, I've seen the pattern that Jesus taught. It's just a very, uh, it's not just effective, but it's just a very beautiful path. Couple stories. A few years back, uh, meeting some of our neighbors, and uh, the wife we discovered, one of our neighbors, the wife was a devout Christian, and her husband was a militant atheist, is almost how I'd describe it. He defended atheism so strong, and she was at church about five days a week. It was unbelievable, and happily married. That's the miracle of it all. And uh, when she discovered I was a pastor, she thought this was an answer to prayer because I'll convert her husband. A few weeks later, she calls and she says, hey, is Cammy? is my wife there? And I said, no, she's at work. She goes, great, I'm sending my husband over. And I said, here it is. She is setting us up so the hopes that I'll convert her husband right here, right now. And uh, when he showed up, you could see he knew what she was trying to do. He didn't want to be here. I knew what she was trying to do. I, I didn't want to be here either. And this is my house, right? And so we just watched the football game because I said, this is super weird. Why don't we just watch the game? And then he went home. She was super mad at me because I had no spiritual conversation. No, he was the same person when he left, and she couldn't understand that. But I knew anything more than that would be disrespectful, right? Not loving. We didn't have a friendship yet. I barely knew the guy. And I think that simple thing to say, I'm not here to convert you, I probably want to just get to know you, uh, started our friendship. And uh, months passed, and there was a day we were doing a fire pit in the backyard. The kids are playing. It's just him and me. And, and then I just kind of said, man, I don't know anything about you. What's your story? And uh, described his childhood, described his parents got a very painful divorce when he was really little. His mom was a devout Catholic, and he was at church all the time. And then he said that when he went through confirmation, he was paroled, and he never went back, right? <laughs> never to return. And he, and he hadn't since. And, uh, and so I knew something happened with church, and he was totally closed to it. There was no open door there. So I thought, I can't invite him to church. I don't know what it'll be. And we were friends for a couple of years, and he was a business leader. And, uh, and so I decided, hey, you know, I love going to leadership conferences. Would you like to go to a leadership conference with me? I'll pay. And he goes, I'd be happy to. And once he said yes, then I told him, well, it's put on by our church. I hope that's okay. And I invited him. We host the Global Leadership Summit. And, and I told him, it won't be as weird as you think. I think you'll have a good time. And, and we attended together. And at the end, I said, how was it? And he said, you're right. Your church isn't as weird as I thought you'd be. Which I thought, that's a win. That's good. A year passes. He, he didn't come back to church. And I, I didn't invite him to anything else either. And uh, that next summer, I said, hey, would you like to come back to that conference? We're doing it again. And he said, I would. He goes, uh, but I'm going to bring a couple of my uh, employees. He goes, I've got three employees I'm bringing. And he goes, you don't have to pay. I'll take care of this. Which I thought was a good sign. And... Uh, we went to the summit together, sat with the four of them, and at the end, as the very last session hits, he turns to them and says the same question I did. Hey, what'd you guys think? And their answer was the same. It wasn't as weird as I thought it was. He goes, yeah, right? It's not that bad. And so then I turned to him a few weeks later. I said, if it's not that bad, I think it's time. Why don't you come to church? Come check this out. And he sat right over there. And at the end of the first service, he said, not that bad. 
I said, well, do you think you'll come back? He goes, I think I might. And he sat over here and attended. And uh, there was one day he called me. I wasn't with him this day, but he called me afterwards, and we went out to coffee together. And he said, something happened to you. I can't explain it. He goes, it was like the pastor had written the entire sermon just for me. I felt like there's only two people in the room, him and me. I felt like he was looking right at me, talking right at me. And uh, I said, what do you think that is? And he goes, I actually think maybe there's a God, and maybe God has a message for me. A few weeks later, uh, he called to tell me that there was a point where he uh, chose grace, chose faith, chose to believe, and said just a fumbling prayer, receiving grace that day, and he was a Christian. And then he asked if I would be willing to baptize him up here on this stage. And I had the privilege, one of the joys of my life, to be in that water and baptize him. And... And, and I would tell you, it, it grew my faith. That journey, those few years with him, grew my faith more than almost anything else I've done. I prayed bolder prayers. I was more dependent on God. I was constantly saying, God, I have no idea what to say. Uh, tell me what not to say. Tell me what to say. God, give me a little more courage. It grew my faith. And I got to watch his faith be transformed and him grow. And we were in a small group together for years just trying to help each other and God invites you, if you're a Christian, into that journey. You just have to say yes. You just have to say, God, put me in the game. Get me around people. Give me eyes to see. Give me discernment what to ask and how to invite. And just listen. And God will use you powerfully in people's lives. He just has this tendency. The other thing, by the way, on respect, these respectful conversations, totally different friend, but similar story. Uh, got introduced to him through a mutual friend and began to have conversations, just a friendship. And he's a business guy, and I was enjoying learning from him. But one of the sessions, I was asking about his life. And what I found is everyone loves to talk about themselves. It's a great thing, right? So I just said, what's your story? And he starts to tell me a story, and I realized quickly there's way more to his story than I thought. And especially I realized, and I just barely kind of just a couple gentle questions, I discovered his childhood was immensely painful, filled with trauma. And, and, I, and I said to him, I said, you've got so much pain when you're a kid. How'd you turn out so successful? And he said, in my teenage years, I just decided none of that stuff's going to help me. So I'm burying it all. And I'm just going to move forward in my life. Forget about childhood. Let's go. And he said, my life was very successful, achieved all these things. But he goes, when I hit my 40s, I started having nightmares in my childhood. And all those things I tried to bury came back up. And he's like, I couldn't deal with it. And I, I said, well, what'd you do? And, and he goes, oh, he goes, you haven't met my wife yet. He goes, my wife is the hero of my story. See, she's a therapist. And she was able, she had no idea my childhood, she was able to unpack my story and help me experience this. And, and I said, okay, pause for one second. And I said, you're an atheist, right? And he said, yeah. I said, I know you don't believe in a God, but what are the odds that you with your past just happened to marry a therapist? And, uh, and he goes, pretty lucky, aren't I? I said, well, you know I have a different faith. I said, I believe there's a God, and I believe every blessing in your life came from his hands. And I would tell you, I believe God, out of love for you, who wanted to care for you, led you to a woman who had all the skills and training to help you when you need it most 20 years into your marriage. Isn't that a beautiful, wouldn't that be beautiful if that was true, that the God of the universe saw you, guided you, and wants to restore and heal you? And he goes, that would be kind of cool. And now, he didn't come to faith. He's not there yet. We're still in a process. But part of what I want to do is I believe God's already at work in their lives. I believe God's been at work in every person's life all the days of their lives, don't you? So part of my job is just to help them see where maybe God is at work, but if you don't believe in God, it's hard to attribute it to them. See, that's part of the fun of this is once you build these friendships, you get into their life, you're on the lookout for what is God already doing in them. How can I help them see that maybe there's a loving God who cares and is involved and wants to help them and be with them? That's the invitation Jesus invites you and me to, to a spiritual journey with friends to help them see there's a good, loving God who cares about them, who loves them, who wants to be restored to them. That's the invitation Jesus gives you and I. Join me, he says. I've done all the work. What I need you to do is jump into the journey to share this message and see what I have to do in someone's life. So how are you doing with this? What are you going to walk out of here today with to go, this is what I've got to do? 
What are you going to reprioritize? Are you going to change your schedule to be around people more so you can build more relationships? Are you going to invest more in the relationships you have to get to know them, to listen to them? Are you going to be a little more prayerful and courageous and respectful when it comes to invites, just thinking through all the different things you can invite them to? And then just as God leads, just make the invitation. Which one are you going to do? Which one are you going to do? Uh, the last piece I would tell you, I hope you hear it. Every one of these relationships for me has been a, yeah, I've been so dependent on prayer. Just consistently praying, God, bless them, be near them, make yourself known to them, guide them, be with them, use me. How are you doing on that? Some of you, if you look at your past, you go, I had friends for a while, and I tried, then I prayed, and it didn't work, and I gave up on them. And you got to just own that. I'd encourage you, don't be that person. Never stop praying. Never give up. You never know when God will step into their lives and transform them. And you want to be there for that. Be the loyal friend, faithful friend, always with them no matter what. Now, we're going to close this service with an exercise. We're going to do it together. It's a little different. But when you walked in, you should have received a pen and a couple stickers. If you did, would you just pull these out right now? If you didn't get one, if you ran past the doors and didn't get one, raise your hand and we will bring them because every person needs two of them, okay? Two, and our guest hosts are gonna come down. Just raise your hands up high so they can see you. Uh, here's what we're gonna do with these stickers. Uh, we are gonna take time together and we're gonna fill these out. If you look at them, it says, I'm praying for. I'm praying for. And then there's this blank spot. And what we're gonna invite the whole church to do is to write the first name or the initials of the people in your life you're praying for, those people that they need God's love and grace. They don't currently believe, but you're hoping there's a day they will. And we're giving you two, one that we want you to fill out for you, and you're gonna take this home, put it someplace you'll see it, and just pray. Pray bold prayers for them. Pray for them, pray for them, pray for them. One for you, and one you're gonna see, we've created these walls around this room and out in the cafe that say, we are here and you're going to see stickers on them from previous services. Basically, we want the whole church praying for the ones for them, but also praying for each other. So for the coming weeks, these walls are going to be around the church. We'd invite you while you're at church, you come by, stop by them and just pause, pray over some of the names. Uh, I've been doing this this morning, just going to the walls, praying for our friends. We as a church want to be praying for the ones God's brought to our lives and every person connected to our church. And so this is where we want to devote ourselves to praying, to just being dependent on God in this. So what I invite you to do now is uh, just go ahead and begin writing those, again, first names or just initials. And two more things, though. Some of you, honestly, you may go, I, I, I'm not a Christian. And you may just want to write your first name or maybe just the word me. And your prayer is, all right, God, if you're real, would you show up in my life, present with me? You just write that. Some of you, if you're honest, you go, I don't have any friends right now that aren't Christians, none that I'm close to at least. And you may want to just put a blank line and your prayer is just, all right, God, fill in the blank. Guide me to some people who I could build a relationship like this. Uh, no guilt or shame on that, by the way. I've had seasons in my life when I would have to put a blank line down. And I just had to change the patterns. Years ago, I had a point where I realized I don't have any good friends who aren't Christians. And I made a blank line on my list and I just changed the pattern, said, I'm, I drink coffee. I'm going to do two coffees a week, an hour at Starbucks where that's devoted to friends. And if I don't have a friend, I'm gonna sit by myself and pray God lead me to something. And you may do something like that. But take this time, just a moment. Fill both these out, identical. One for you, one to put up here at the church. And then in a moment, I'm gonna guide us through a time of prayer together. So go ahead and fill them out now, would you? So here's how I'd like to close. I'd like to close with us together praying for all our friends. And so would you stand up now? And if you would, just kind of as a sign to heaven, would you just hold up those stickers? The stickers with the names of the people you love and care about, you're hopeful for. And I just want to say a prayer for every single one of us that God would move powerfully in these lives, okay? So let's pray. 
Now, God, you know every name on these stickers. Every single one of them is someone you love and care about. God, I would ask you to move powerfully in our friends and in our family, in our coworkers, in our neighbors. God, would they sense your presence and your love and your grace. Might you work powerfully in them. Give them sleepless nights where they just have time to consider. God, orchestrate the circumstances so they begin to ask questions and think about you. And God, for each of the people who have a name held up high, God, would you use them? Give them great thoughtfulness about how to engage, questions to ask, invitations to make. God, use them in their lives as a friend who can just be a spiritual guide with all the tough questions. God, we would ask that these seats would be filled with our friends, that over time they'd come to faith, be baptized, and be used powerfully, God, for you. So now, God, we commit ourselves to you. You did all the work for salvation, and now you're trusting us with this, God. We commit ourselves to be good stewards of this incredible message. We commit ourselves to this now in the name of Christ. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. All right, so two things, again. One is, as you walk out, you're gonna see these walls that say, we are here. Go ahead and put this sticker, one of them, on those walls. I want to clarify for you, last night people started just putting on any wall in the church. It isn't for just any wall, very specific walls. Second, you heard about it earlier, we're doing group launch right now. We want every person in our church, it's a big church, to have community and connection. We'd love it you stop by the atrium. If you don't have a small group, you can get in one today, so swing by there. But thanks so much for being at church. Have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday, and uh, we'll see you back next weekend. Blessings. Blessings.